Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Well, at least today was a better day. Of course, I'm referring to Tottenham Hotspur charity match that was played today, um, which was excellent. I was there today. It was all put together by the club's kit man, Steve Dukes. Amazing day down, just down the road from me, actually, in Bishop Stortford Football Club. About three and a half, four thousand fans there. Um, all in aid of charities, including the Essex uh, and the Hearts Air Ambulance. If you've watched my videos before, you'll know hopefully all about this and, and what Steve the Kitman has done. Uh, and the reason he did it in kind of memory of his his father. Um, honestly, that might have been the most entertaining Tottenham game I've watched this season. I know the competition is quite low, but it was brilliant. Spurs won 7-1. Tottenham Hotspur scored goals. It was... Let, let me just read you this starting lineup. This was the starting lineup I've just watched um, out on a lovely sunny day. Um, Aurelio Gomez in goal. Chimbonda, Dawson, Ledley King, Danny Rose, back four. Midfield three of Sandro, Huddleston and Edgar Davids. Up front, Aaron Lennon, Robbie Keane, Jermaine Defoe. If ever I needed anything to cheer me up after traips and up and down from Birmingham yesterday, it was today's match. Um, and yeah, it was superb, honestly. And subs as well. Uh, Wilson Palacios, I know, unfortunately, he only came on for a little bit because he got what looked like quite a bad injury. Um, Yunus Kabul was there as well. Michelle Vorm, um, Sebastian Bersong, and Harry Redknapp managed them. Uh, they were playing a team of celebs and ex-players. Um, so you had Yaya Torre was on there. Wayne Routledge was on the other side. Carlton Cole was on the other side. Um, there's some celebs like Mark Wright, Billy Wingrove. Uh, Anthony Costa from Blue. Um, honestly, it was just the tonic, I think, for a lot of the Spurs fans that were just so, I guess, fed up with what's happening at, currently. And to go out and watch all of these players who, I'll be completely honest with you, they only retired a lot of them very recently, like maybe last year, quite a few of them. Um, I think Danny Rose may be still looking to get a, a new club. And and they were taking it seriously. There was there was fun to be had, but there was a lot of those players, especially defenders, really trying to defend well for the Spurs team, which is why they only conceded one. They were showing no mercy. Um, it was superb. Yeah, like I say, seven one. Jermaine Defoe hat trick. Uh, Robbie Queen. Robbie Queen. Robbie Keane two goals. Sandro scored uh, a goal that then sparked him into a wild celebration, running along the pitch and doing the Ronaldo celebration at the end of it. Um, and Robbie Keane's uh, little son came on for the end because they had a few players that couldn't make it. Uh, Van der Vaart, Berbatov, unfortunately, were all kind of prepared and ready to come over and just just things got in the way, unfortunately, at the last second, so they couldn't come. So, yeah, they, they stuck. Um, Robbie Keane's young son came on, had a couple of opportunities to score and did grab the last goal. Um, and Steve Dukes' son, George, who's a, a coach, uh, he came on as well. And it was just an amazing atmosphere all the fans around the pitch, all Spurs fans. Like, it was just a massive congregation of Spurs fans enjoying themselves. How often have we had that recently? This was probably not the, the start you were expecting this video. You were probably expecting There's a lot of people today that were saying, when are we getting the, like, the sad sigh? But you know what? Sometimes it's just nice to detach yourself from what's going on now. Don't worry. I'm going to whinge a plenty about what's going on now in the rest of this video. But I just wanted to start with a bit of nostalgia um, something that was a really good day for a great cause um, and personally it absolutely brought the fan out in me because a lot of these players were the players of the Red Nap, Joel era, some into the Poch era as well that came before I covered the club so for me I just saw them as a fan um, and I was very very fortunate that, that Jukesy the kit man invited me along to, to come and do like media stuff for the game um, and that meant that after the game as all the players were kind of just kind of relaxing, eating some food after the game, I was allowed to just kind of walk amongst them and just start chatting with them and, and getting little interviews and things like that. And so massively the fan came out of me. And they're such good guys. Um, who did I speak to? I spoke to uh, Jorelio Gomez. is an incredible character with brilliant English. He was fascinating to talk to. Um, asked him, obviously, about... The game, but also kind of what's happening at Spurs right now. 
Um, Aaron Lennon, lovely to speak to Aaron Lennon. Aaron Lennon was superb in the match as well, looks incredibly fit and just a real pleasure to talk to him because I think, I don't know, I kind of, on the outside as a fan, you kind of maybe saw him sometimes as, he could maybe come across as a bit sullen, I don't know. But just lovely to actually speak to him in person and just, just destroy any of that kind of myth or anything. He was just so nice. Uh, such a lovely guy to talk to. Speak to Keno as well, Robbie Keane. That was lovely. Um, Tom Huddleston obviously got a terrific coaching career going on at, at Man United. I think he's registered as a player. And you could tell his touch has not left him. The ones for me that stood out, in case anyone is interesting, Huddleston, Keane... Uh, Defoe and Lennon are so sharp. Sandro was very sharp as well, actually. I know he's been doing a lot of training on the beach um, out in Brazil, and, and he's just he's just mad. He's just such a character. Because obviously, I was getting to see what they were doing when they were coming down the tunnel and around the dressing room area. And they, the Brazilians, are just there's obviously a thing with the Brazilians and Tottenham. They're just great fun to be around. Um, Yunus Cabal had a great chat with him. Very very nice guy. Um, Michelle Vaughan asked Michelle Vaughan spoke to him a little bit about Arna Slot as well he had lots of good things to say about him um, yeah so absolutely fanboyed it I really did um, it's weird because cause work kind of maybe desensitises you slightly to these things but when you can kind of go back into fan mode um, it was lovely honestly really fantastic day um and like I say, for a great cause, and there's auctions going on, there's all signed shirts, signed balls, all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, I'll pop a link into the comments uh, below. I'll pin a comment to the top. If anyone, it's no pressure to do so whatsoever, but if anyone did want to get involved, um, I'll pop in a link there if anyone wants to, to donate, contribute, go into the auctions, whatever. I'll pop some links in there if people want to do that. Um, it was just much needed. And and thank you so much to the, the very many, very nice people that came up to me to say hello and, and to talk about stuff. Um, you kind of made me feel like uh, very much a Z-list celebrity, I should say. Not, not what I even hasten to use the word celebrity because there were proper celebrities out there and especially the players. But um, no, it was lovely. It was lovely. Lots of nice chats with lots of very nice people. And for me, it was a bit nostalgic also in the sense of going back to Bishop Stortford Football Club, which is one of the clubs I used to cover when I was a non-league reporter uh, and meeting the lovely people that work at that club as well. And they've just had a brilliant season. They've won promotion as well. They were waiting to find out, actually, just as um, as I was leaving, whether they were going to be in the Conference North or Conference South, which if you're a Conference South team, or sorry, you're a team down south having to travel up north three games, it's an absolute nightmare. But... Um, yeah, I don't think at the point that started this, I don't think it was known yet. So uh, hopefully they get what they want as well. But yeah, it was a lovely day. Much needed. Um, you can probably see I'm so much more relaxed. Had I done this video um, early in the day uh, and that game hadn't been on today, it would have just been angry, ranty, Alistair Gold. But he's still coming. Don't worry, because there's a lot of stuff that annoyed me um, in the last 48 hours, especially about Spurs. Um, that I found a bit mind-boggling. So I'll tell you what, let's get into that now. Let's get into that. There's, I know some of you that won't maybe care too much about the, the charity match and the former players, but hopefully there's a lot of Spurs fans out there that uh, that will have been will have wanted to be there because it was very it was only 4,000, like I said, 3,500. So the tickets sold out within 24 hours. Um, but from what I understand, speaking to Dukesy, this is going to be a thing that's going to become bigger and bigger and bigger and it's going to be played at bigger stadiums. Um, so don't worry, next year... And, and all of the current players, or a lot of current players, have said to him, as soon as they retire, they're playing as well. They're coming on board. And I think if they watch the highlights of this and the standard, they'll definitely want to do it. Like I say, Danny Rose was launching to some challenge. So was Sandro. This was not as friendly as they come. It was fun, but it was also got a lot of serious stuff in there. So, <sighs> the mood in the saloon. The current Tottenham Hotspur team. Um, do you know what? Tottenham Hotspur and any sense of timing, particularly good timing, they just, they're not happy bedfellows. They do not go hand in hand, Spurs and good timing. If there's a way for Tottenham Hotspur to shoot themselves in the foot when they don't even need to have a gun, <laughs> they will do it. Honestly, I was as surprised, and many of us were, on Friday night um, about kind of what started to come out of the football club. Look, if if there wasn't enough pressure on Saturday, 
on Ryan Mason's shoulders to go and win a huge match that, well, I say huge, huge in the context of what they're fighting for now, you know, trying to get European football. It was a big game. And for him to, no, to stand any chance of trying to get the head coach job permanently, there was so much pressure on him. But Spurs pretty much decided, yep, beep, 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 we're going to reverse this truck and just dump a load more pressure on you. That's what we're going to do. Because, you know, less than 24 hours before they're about to kick off this important game, news started to emerge from within Tottenham Hotspur, uh, with the club insisting that they had not met with Julian Nagelsmann, uh, Julian Nagelsmann, despite their respect for him, and they did not intend to meet with Julian Nagelsmann at all. Um, he was not a candidate for them right now. <laughs> Honestly, I I was a bit lost for words. Um, on on many levels, um, it for, for Spurs fans and a lot of the journalists, it made no sense whatsoever. It was Tottenham clearly trying to get ahead of the curve, shape the narrative. Um, I think there's just this fear right now at the club of being seen to be rejected by anyone. But without putting too fine a point on it, they ended up making themselves look even dafter by kind of trying to get in there first because it made no sense. Um, you know, I, presumably they were worried that, you know, something was going to come from Germany and, and Nagelsmann's camp and they were just like, oh, we'll get in there first, make it, make it all in our favour. I, I don't know. Um, they might assume what happened at Chelsea because Nagelsmann and Chelsea, that's, if you look into that, that's a little bit like, uh, where both sides seem to be saying different things. When Nagelsmann camp was saying he walked away, the Chelsea side of stuff, you talk to people there, it sounds like they withdrew from that. So I think, I don't know, Spurs were just trying to do another version of that. I don't know. Because look, the truth is, Tottenham did make contact with Nagelsmann uh, and his people to sound out his interest in the project at Tottenham. That's that's what sh that's what should have happened. That's uh, doing due diligence. That is looking at the best candidates out there for the role and making inquiries into whether they are available. So that's fine. Um, I mean, you know, the very much the the, the way it was coming out was, was that Spurs had not met with Nagelsmann. I guess I guess you can look at the technicalities of that. You could say, well, maybe it wasn't in person. Maybe it was this. Maybe it was that. Maybe it was done through intermediaries. Intermediaries. Maybe it was done over a phone call, whatever, whatever. I'm not saying specifically which it was of those. I just know that contact was made with him and his people. Um, because, let's be honest, the club, from what I understand, is looking for a project manager to rebuild them. They're looking for someone who wants to be in it for the long haul. I said before about someone that didn't want to see them as a second, or, or sorry, they didn't want to be seen as a second choice to that person, which maybe that's a Nagelsmann thing. Maybe, you know, there was a feeling he didn't. I don't know. Um, but look, if you're looking for that type of project manager that plays a certain brand of football and is in it for the long haul, you know, you look at Nagelsmann and he ticks that box. He ticks the box for attacking football. He ticks the box of also being a big name manager as well as that to excite the fans. He ticks the box of um, bringing a real kind of modern cutting edge football that, let's be honest, we haven't probably seen too much of Spurs in the last four or five years or so. Um, so yeah, he, he does tick every box in that sort of style. So to not even kind of make any contact would look like being negligent. It would. Uh, and this is the thing, this is, which I don't think Spurs thought about. It made it look just crazy. Like, why wouldn't you try to um, meet or interview um, one of the best kind of young managers out there in the world right now? Um, yeah, it was just mad. Because, you know, just to make it sound like there was no interest at all, it just reflected poorly on them, especially as... There's been interest in him, you know, over the years. This was the third time that they've considered appointing him. The first time was after Poch went and they went for Jose Mourinho instead. Second time was after Mourinho went, actually, it was. Um, but um, Nagelsmann went to Bayern and Spurs, of course, went for Nuno Espirito Santo. Um and yeah, so you fast forward now to 2023 and the interest did not progress to the formal interview stage. 
Spurs, of course, as they're going to, strongly refute suggestions that Nagelsmann turned them down. I mean, technically, because I've, I've heard them use this before, you can kind of get away from that because technically you could argue that he was never offered the job. Um, because there's ways around that. You can say that there's discussions over a job without actually having that formal written offer. So you can't reject someone that hasn't formally offered you stuff. I think that's that's the way these football clubs get around these things. Um, but yeah, um, something, whatever, something clearly happened during these conversations that made um, any progress to stop in its tracks. Um, you know, it could well be that they just got the sense from Nagelsmann that he wasn't that into it. It could be that, which would obviously kind of uh, lend itself to this let's get in here first approach. It could be that they decided that he wasn't the right man for the exact kind of rebuild they're doing. It could be. There's obviously was some concerns in Germany about man management style. That's one thing. Um, I mean, it, it could be. that That could be one element of it. Um, but it, it's just... Difficult to understand why that decision would be made almost two months after Conte had gone. Like, why so far down the line do you suddenly decide he wouldn't be the right man? Which is kind of puts that little bit of doubt on that way of, of spinning it, I guess. Um, and also, I guess, the whole point of not wanting to speak to them. It's like, why wouldn't you at least sit down for a full interview and listen to someone like Nagelsmann and what they've got to say and what they could do for your club. Um, yeah, it, doesn't, it did not make sense as well. You know, If they're saying he did not turn them down, so why would there not be a full discussion and talk with him about things? Uh, because, again, that would be due diligence. That would be doing the thing you're meant to do. Um, and this is why people, I think, will doubt this. This is the trouble. When you're trying to almost proactively come out um, and and make something very clear to the public. It's people are going to doubt it because of that, you know. From the outside, I think a lot of people would think that Spurs needed Nagelsmann more than Nagelsmann needed Spurs. Um, so to kind of make out that this kind of paint this whole picture of nah, there's more suitable candidates. I think we'll go to. It just felt completely f like they did it. It fell flat on its face. The whole attempt to do that. Um, regardless of what happened, this is the thing we don't entirely know the exact circumstances of what happened because you're only going to have it's going to be he said she said type thing, both sides saying whatever they want to say about it, and and we've had this in so many stories before. But either way, Spurs can't come out of it and a win because either way they look incompetent if they're not considering such a strong candidate, but they also look unambit unambitious if he rejected them. So it's like, oh, it was just one of those where just let it go, is my thinking. This is the irony. We call for communication and stuff like this. But actually, in this scenario, it's a bit like, did you really need to do that? Was there any need to proactively come out and, and kind of make this clear? Um, it reminded me a lot of the Antonio Conte talks in the summer of 2021 when, you know, they broke down and... Everything coming from Conte's people suggested that, you know, oh, he wasn't convinced about Spurs' ambition. And everything coming out of Spurs was very much, oh, you know, his demands were unrealistic. And it was, like, really risky for the club. We don't want to put this club at risk with some of the things. But then, obviously, that was made all utterly ridiculous by the fact that three months later, Daniel Levy's kind of going, like, cap in hand back to Conte and saying, please, please join us, Antonio, please. Um, it didn't really make any sense. And then, obviously, Conte had nothing better on the table, compromised what he wanted out of football uh, and we all knew it was a compromise that was really never going to last so yeah so here we are we find ourselves um, back um, I was going to say back to where we were in 2021 but you know what I think it's worse I would actually say that well 2021 the, the managerial search was an utter farce and I'm hoping that that doesn't become the case in the in the couple of Oh my god, I got about, 40, about two, three, no, almost a month to not make that happen. But what I would say, the reason I say it's worse is because, you know, you've got a 
said it a million times, so sorry. No head coach of the men's team, no head coach of the women's team, no director of football, star player approaching the final year of his contract, a captain who could be on his way out of the club this summer, um, and just no real discernible leadership coming from the top of the club. That's the biggest issue, I think, is that the club just seemed to be drifting aimlessly. If we see football as an ocean, Spurs are just kind of just drifting we don't know whether they're going to reach land or whether they're going to hit the rocks. No one really knows. It feels like there's no plan. There's no, continuing with the analogy, um, wind in their sails. You know, There's no sense of where they're heading and what they want to do because the past suggests this ridiculous course going here, there and everywhere and, and sailing into a storm. I'm absolutely hammering that analogy, but I'm going to go with it. Um, and this whole attempt to kind of force the narrative and shape it just blew up in their face. And it, and it created, there was ridicule across social media. No one really understood it. Um, and having been at Villa Park yesterday, the atmosphere among the travelling fans, they were just sick and fed up before the game had even started. And they were brilliant. This is the thing about the travelling fans. I'll always say this about them. They were so noisy. Villa Park was quite um it's a it's a ground that when it's going can really kind of rock it's got a bit of an old white hart lane vibe to it. it's a proper traditional old football club um so football stadium but you could hear the spurs fans throughout and they were supporting their team as well don't get me wrong it's not like they were just there in a kind of a toxic way they were really supporting the team but there were the chance the the levy out chance the uh daniel levy get out of our club chance the first one came 15 seconds in and I think it came another two occasions in the first half. Then within seconds of the second half starting, it was there. I'd probably say maybe six or seven times I heard those chants throughout the game. Um, and it was it was pretty much the bulk of the away fans joining in as well. Um, I think I heard some Villa fans behind me saying, we want Levy in. Um, I'm guessing that's because their team were winning. But... Um, I don't think, from what I understand, I don't think Daniel Levy was there. Um, from what I understand, I don't think he was at the game. Who knows? That might be a good thing. Maybe that means he's actually kind of sorting something on a director of football or um, manager front. Um, yeah, who knows? But it might just be me. I wouldn't. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to speculate. It's, it's daft to speculate where he might be, having just speculated where he might be. Um, I don't know. I don't know, but he, he, I understand he wasn't there. Um, but it was just another massive display of dissatisfaction with the way, with the state of the club that he is meant to be, where well, he runs. Um, and the thing is, I've always said this, it comes, when it's coming from those who spend the most, the ones who follow Spurs home, away, abroad, and, and shell out so much money for the club, you know, he has to listen to them. He has to. Um... Because, again, I felt so sorry for Ryan Mason because the Nagelsmann news just piled the pressure on. It was almost just people were expecting. He had to he had to win. Um, because, you know, he's trying to prove that he's the in-house solution uh, to all of Tottenham's problems. Um, and it just wasn't fair, honestly. I know there's some people now that it's very much results dependent fans will kind of be up and down so I know some of you don't I know some of you will maintain very steadfast views whether it's win or loss whatever but I do feel that a lot of people will kind of go with the flow so I just felt it was unfair on Mason putting this amount of pressure on him kind of making that daft decision to be putting or letting news get out there the night before the game um because he he's a young coach with so much potential um, he's had so little time to make any real impact on the team whatsoever. Um, he's kind of using a team that he's inherited that are very much built for a different system, a different manager. A lot of the problems were deeply rooted um, and previous coaches have had the issue. Let's not forget he's the third coach to take on this team this season. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's he's trying to polish the minute that he's inherited um and it's one born of disjointed decision making just across the board and an inability to maintain this clear approach so that 
I said this again, it's another thing, I hate to repeat myself, but some of these things are so frustrating that it is a squad that is just like this patchwork of previous managers' players. This is why I keep saying so much, there needs to be a reset and a rebuild this summer. Um, and just identify how you want to play, identify a uh, philosophy throughout the entire club, and build a squad with an academy supplying it as well that is of one single vision. And to be fair to Mason, that's what he wants, that's what he keeps going on about. But I just felt his post-match was just this really sad post-match um, press conference. He, you could tell he was just a man that was just thrown to the wolves yet again, as he was in 2021, um, just being the face of trying to explain the chaos. It's like being reeked behind him and above him. Um, I know there's some people that will never take to Mason for for some reason or another. Uh, maybe they see him as... I don't know. I don't know what they see him as, but I just felt so sorry for him. Um, he was asked, I think it was Jamie Weir from Sky, asked him uh, whether this latest defeat kind of shook, made him doubt his desire to want to become Tottenham manager. He said, absolutely not. I remain consistent. I believe we're doing a good job in terms of what we're trying to create. I understand we don't have a huge amount of time to change too much, and we've seen this kind of thing too many times this season, going a goal down early and making it difficult for ourselves. But we understand we do have two important games, and it's still in our hands what we want to achieve. We have to learn and be better for next week We've got because we've got another difficult game. Um, but yeah, like I say, he looked like a guy that realised that his dream of managing his boyhood club is probably dissolving right right now. In this moment, I think it is. Um, he needed really to win every one of these remaining three games, I think, to, to at least throw his hat into the ring. Um, and instead, yeah, Spurs do what Spurs do. They concede within um, eight minutes for the third away game in a row. Um, and how's this for rubbish stats? So they haven't won a single game on the road in the Premier League since January. And even worse than that, they have not won a game outside of London in the Premier League since October. It's pathetic. It's such a weak mentality. I've said this because I had to do podcasts for kind of um, some of our reporters within our organisation that cover other clubs. I remember doing one for the Newcastle uh, Chronicle recently where I just said, it, and this was pre-game, if the crowd make a bit of noise, Spurs will crumble. It's just unfortunately been the way this season, especially early on. And lo and behold, we saw what happened at Newcastle. It was an absolute debacle. Uh, it's not my fault. I didn't tell the Newcastle fans to be noisy. They had already been told. I, I was actually on that podcast. Um, I was told that they, uh, the club had, had told them already that they wanted them to be the loudest they'd ever been because it was such a crunch Champions League decider or qualification decider. Um, so yeah, it's not my fault. It's honest. Um, he was asked about that, those stats, and Mason said many different things contribute to that, but ultimately it's not good enough for a club of this size. You can't expect to be competing where we wanted to compete and have that sort of record. So that needs to improve. That needs to be a collective thing. That needs to be driven from all of us. It isn't a good enough stat, and it needs to change. Um, and yeah, this is what I feel with Mason. I think think we're now at the point where. Levy can't really turn to him because it won't appease the fan base. Um, it just won't. Because despite Mason insisting he's ready, um, and his valid claims, I still do agree with that he hasn't had enough time to make any kind of real change or dent in the mentality or the squad. Um, you know, whoever comes in is going to need this preseason um, and a lot of ins and outs. It's going to be a proper. Next season could even be quite difficult um, because of the changes that are going to be needed. It could it could start a bit like Poch's first year in twenty twenty sorry twenty fourteen, um, where he was very much trying to work out his squad and and who he wanted to trust in. I guess, um, but yeah. But I think the problem is is for Mason is that the supporters want change, and as an inside man. He's not seen this change. I think he's almost guilty by association with Levy and with 
uh, previous structures, I guess, which is is entirely unfair. He's very much his own man. Um, but it's just, it's an angry, frustrated, apathetic time for a lot of Tottenham fans. You know, they've not only seen this Nagelsmann stuff now with, you know, one of the brightest young coaching minds in the world apparently not being in consideration. And on top of that, Daniel Levy deciding that he was not going to make any form of contact or call to Mauricio Pochettino. And on top of that, Mauricio Pochettino now heading to, I don't know whether it'll be announced by the time of even this video goes out, as the new Chelsea manager, which feels so wrong and sounds so wrong. Um, you know, Chelsea obviously is like probably one of the few clubs that are actually making Spurs look better. Um, but then they're going to hire Spurs, uh, one of their beloved managers of, of recent times. Um, it's just, it's going to sting so bad for the Tottenham fans when they see him in that, you know, holding up the Chelsea shirt and all of that. And I'm still torn on it. I'm still torn on it. There's, there's a big part of me, I'd say 90% of me actually kind of understands it. And if Spurs aren't going to come for him, then hey, what's he gonna? What, what's he supposed to do? Just sit there not in a job? Um, if a club shows that they really want him, why shouldn't he go there? But yes, there is this ten percent of me that's like, why Chelsea? Why them? Of all the clubs that you probably could have your pick of in in the season or so to come, does it have to be one of Spurs' biggest rivals? Um, and as I said before, I'm intrigued to see how the fans take it, whether they take it out on Levy and Spurs or whether they there are some that, you know, it will leave a, a sour taste in terms of Pochettino. I'm intrigued to say, my gut feeling says that the first game he comes to Spurs Stadium, he'll get a great ovation. That's my feeling. Um, but it's just sad to see that it's happened. Regardless of, of who is at fault, it's just very sad that it's come to that um, that he will end up being their manager. Yeah, very, very, very strange. Um, as for Mason, um, I think the best thing for him now is if it looks like he's not going to get the job permanently, I think presumably he would stay at Spurs while doing this, but you'd think now is the chance to kind of get his name out there. Try and find, uh, use what he's done at Spurs over the last two spells, get himself... I don't know, maybe, maybe you'd go championship, maybe. Uh, interview for championship roles and, and look to build his career. A bit like Vincent Company's done. Um, obviously, Vincent Company was at Anderlecht first, but maybe for Mason it would be starting at that level. He was asked on Friday whether he could see himself at the club in two years, and he's just like, I don't know, I can't answer that. Uh, because I think he's fully aware that now's the time for him. Because a lot of people... Guesty, who does the podcast with me, Golden Guest Talk Tottenham, he's often saying this, and he's spot on. That people see that Mason's 31, and they say he's too young, he's not ready, but he's been coaching for six years. This is the thing. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter about age. If you've got, he's got his pro license, he's got all the relevant qualifications. He has put so many hours in on the training grounds, and and obviously by the end of this spell, he'll have had 13 games in charge, 12 in the Premier League. He does have that experience now. Um, you know, people like Xavi Alonso, they haven't got much more experience than Ryan Mason. Um, so yeah, I think he needs to get out there and hopefully build himself a career that becomes impossible to ignore for Tottenham and, and Levy or whoever may be the chairman in, in a couple of years' time. Who knows? Um, because everyone that has worked with him that I've spoken to said he's going to become a really good manager. Um, and hopefully ends up being the manager of Spurs one day, but it just feels like right now it just isn't the right time for him, and it might actually be a good thing for him not to get it right now. He might not see it that way, but I actually think that stepping into the absolute chaos that is Tottenham right now and the huge job that the next manager has, it might be something that would sink his managerial career before it gets going. Um, whereas now he can go away and build slightly out of that limelight and, and just keep on progressing and growing and, and I think we'll see a very talented young manager come through um, I don't buy into the some of the criticisms that he's getting just because they just had a bad 
match yesterday um, and he's dealing with a lot of other people's problems and trying to fight fires um, that are breaking out everywhere. So yeah, that's most of my view on this. And also his squad, his squad, he's, he's got so many limits to this squad in terms of trying to turn it into how he would play football and what he would use them for. And I think a lot of that um, you could see in the midfield. I think you can. The midfield is a great example of the limitations in not being able to do what Mason wants to do with the squad. Because Pierre Emil Hoybier, Oliver Skip, I've said this in the past. Hopefully, you remember. It's not just me going. Oh, I've said this before. Um, I've always felt that Hoybier and Skip were each other's replacements. I didn't really see them as a pairing. I always kind of felt like it was early in the season. Benton Corbusuma, Hoybier or Skip. So I don't know why I'm doing this. Like I'm, uh, I don't know what I was doing, like praying or a crocodile uh, or a snake. Um, yeah, to play together, they're just too similar. Especially if you're using a two in midfield. I think um, injuries obviously have played their part, uh, but they just they've got some ability to play these through passes and some abilities to attack. But it's just not a very natural part of their game. And when you have two players like that in there, suddenly you just have this chasm between the defence and the attack. I was watching yesterday, there were so many times when, when Skip and Hoybier were sitting back. And there were so many times, I'd say Hoybier especially, probably more so than Skip, when the ball was coming to him and his first thought was to knock it off quickly sideways or behind him, rather than looking very quickly for a way to advance the play. And that creates this division between a defence which ends up becoming, you know, almost like a six-man defence, uh, well, kind of a, a banks of eight yesterday in a 4-4-2. Um, no, it wasn't. Yes, it was 4-4-2 yesterday. I'm actually getting confused with watching the 4-3-3 today of the, the older Spurs. Um, but yeah, it, it just didn't work. And do you know what? I think if they it was those two and then you put a third in there and a creative attacking midfielder, I think it probably works. I think it's fine. I mean... You know, if you're looking at the current squad who's out on loan, probably a Tongi or a Lo Celso maybe sitting kind of just at the head of that with the two of them behind him. Um, yeah, maybe that works a lot better and gives them a, a more of a link between the, the attack and the, the defence. But as it was, it, it doesn't work. And, you know, we said it at the time, so it's not a new thing, but my Goodness, the absence of Rodrigo Bentancur is so huge and it's being felt so long after he went. Um, he was playing some of the best football of his career. He was saving Tottenham in so many matches. You weren't just relying on Harry Kane there. You had Bentancur and Kane both able to rescue the situation. Um, and he was becoming a more attacking offensive midfielder than he probably had ever re previously been and, and he was getting this good partnership with Hoybier where one would see it don't get me wrong everything wasn't perfect while Ben Kerr was playing but he was a, still a game changer for Tottenham and they lost so much when he got that injury um, and you know we don't know when we're going to get him back probably towards the end of the year um, but yeah yeah. One small positive is Basuma getting his first minutes back. Played half an hour or so. Um, and he looked really bright. He looked, because we've all kind of felt this, with no disrespect intended to Antonio Conte, but his rigid system that he has, we're intrigued to see what Basuma would be like back in a system that maybe is more similar to how he'd been playing at Brighton. And I think we got a bit of a sense of that. Just only in half an hour. Of, I know it's Spurs chasing games, so it wasn't the best example, but. He was very bright. He was very progressive in his play. He was always looking to get the ball forward. Um, I've got his stats here, which kind of said that exactly. So he was accurate with 30 of his 31 passes. Seven of them, kind of more importantly, were played into the final third. So that's quite important. You know, a big old chunk of those 30 passes were played into the final third to progress the play. He completed both of the long balls he attempted, and he won one of his two ground duels. And actually spoke after the game. He said... I'm ready. I'm ready to play. If they ask me, I'm ready to play. I'm here to help the team, my teammates and everyone. I'm always ready to play because the last three months wasn't easy for me. I'm just working really hard and now I think I'm okay and ready to play to help the team more than today. Because don't forget, he'd been out for three months, the um, surgery on his ankle. So it'd be interesting to see now if with a full week 
kind of increasing his fitness after getting 30 minutes or so, could he start maybe getting an hour out of him? Maybe. Um, I do think Spurs would benefit massively from having him in there, uh, just to give that little bit of a different dynamic. And, and obviously, yes, he'll, he'll tire eventually, but he also will bring a freshness to begin with in that team. Um, but yeah, so that was one small positive we can grasp onto. Um, the right-hand side was not good. The right-hand side that started the game, I thought Richarlison, that was one of his worst performances for me. He offered nothing. Look, he's going to battle for the ball, but because Villa were playing such a high line, essentially Spurs just needed to break it every time. That was the trick, was to knock it over the top and, and Sonny to run through. And unfortunately, Sonny just kept getting caught offside. I think he had four offsides. Um, but Richarlison doesn't have the pace to be the man to break the line. And that was, yeah, there was a bit of a killer for him. And his whole game very much was very pedestrian, didn't get anywhere. Porro, ooh, Porro, he kind of only increased those fears that he can't play as a right back, but he also can't play as a, a winger. All of the good stuff that you kind of saw him do against Palace wasn't there um, at all yesterday. He it wasn't dynamic enough with the ball and his use of the ball. He just kind of got stuck in this middle ground where he wasn't really defending particularly well and he wasn't attacking very well. So that wasn't great. Uh, Kuliszewski came on and it's a difficult one. I, th I felt he made an impact. Um, it was a bright little cameo just without the end product. He had one of those where he cut inside and where in the past you know he'd curl it straight into that top corner. Um, and I think he sent, did he, the keeper save one, I think another he sent flying over the bar. A little bit on Kudusevsky. There have been some reports I saw from Italy suggesting that he might just head back on loan. Uh, his loan might end, he might go back to Juventus. From what I understand, Spurs expect to sign him. Um, if you're not aware, part of his loan deal was that if Spurs finished top four, it, was, it would become an obligation to sign him. Um, otherwise, it would just become an option but from what I understand, Spurs are likely or expecting to take that option. He's very much being seen as a Tottenham player for next season. So, look, I know his form hasn't been amazing this season at all because he set such high standards last year. But again, I don't think we can forget that he's, what, 22, 23 years old. Um, he's got so much potential. I think the figure to sign him once you take off the loan fees that have already been paid, I think it's around £30 million. I'm sorry, for a player who we know, we've seen what he can do last. I've seen some people say, just let him go back. No, remember what he did. Remember he's a young player. Remember the incredible things he can do with the ball. It's just now about him adapting to people knowing his game in England and having to not always cut in from the right-hand side, being able to go different ways and stuff. And he will do that. He's very tactically intelligent, very determined, and an incredibly hard-working player. Um... So I'm sorry, for me, 30 million for Kulusevski, even after having an iffy season, is a snip. I think he's a kind of player. You could even buy him for 30 million and probably sell him for more than that instantly because I think other people would appreciate his potential and how good he can be. Um, I'm excited to see, you know, what the next manager can do with him as well. You know, that's always the one benefit of, of a change is that certain players will get a fresh lease of life and, uh, and hopefully he's one of them. Um... Behind him, Christian Romero. Ugh. We spoke last week about how when he's controlled and disciplined, he's amazing. When he loses that control, he's reckless. Unfortunately, this was in the latter category. He was all over the shop. He got caught with a wild challenge up the pitch that left him out of position for Villa's first goal. Um, for Jacob Rams, he just you know had oceans of space again, so Porro just kind of got nowhere near him. That's because there was a big gap in behind Romero. Then he conceded the the free kick that Douglas Luiz scored from because it was just another late lunge. And then he got a yellow card with another reckless attempt at trying to make a tackle miles away from his goal. It was over on the left hand side of the pitch, um, nowhere near it was meant to be. Um, and I think. One of, the, one of the many tasks the next manager will have is taming Romero because he's so talented, but he is inconsistent. And if you can absolutely 
train him not to go wandering off, not to launch into these tackles. He has no need to make. Do you know what? Watching Ledley King today, he played 31 minutes on with his one knee, and it was the first time he was saying that he told me he played in 10 years. Um, and it may have even been his testimonial. It was the first time he played, and he played 31 minutes. And you just saw how class he is. It was all in his mind. He didn't. He doesn't need to dive in. He doesn't need to throw himself at the ball. He just only picks his moments. Um, and that was what Thierry Henry said, didn't he? He was, like, he was the toughest defender he'd ever faced because he stood you up. He didn't need to. He would say, yeah, you want to run? Okay, right, we'll, we'll go there. And I will like sh just shepherd you away from goal. Uh, if I need to put my foot in, I'll put my foot in. Whereas Romero, it almost seems to be fly in first, think later. And he doesn't need to because he's got a lot of the qualities that I see in Ledley King. I really do see them. But he's got this recklessness that Ledley King never did have on the football pitch. Um, and yeah, new manager just, just needs to sort that out. Just quickly on the free kick as well. I felt like Fraser Forster could have done better. He made a good save early in the game. Um, I'm trying to remember who it was from. Maybe Ramsey. Um, but... Yeah, the free kick, he kind of got a full hand to it and still let it kind of push it into his own net. So, yeah, it could have done better with that. Um, and then there's Harry Kane. Harry Kane. <sighs> you know, look, he didn't have the greatest game in the world. No one did. Um, but still another goal. Um, earning the penalty. Putting it into the net. Um... I might be able to hear Indy going mad downstairs because you can hear another dog barking in the background. He looks like just this world-weary figure right now, Harry Kane, not Indy, Harry Kane, of carrying a football club on his shoulders. That's what he's tried to do. Uh, yesterday's goal was his 27th goal in the Premier League this season. I still cannot fathom or get my head around the fact how he has managed to score so many Premier League goals in such a... A poor side. Um, it's phenomenal. It, it's probably one of the greatest mysteries of this season. It really is. He deserves so much better, and so do the fans. Um, yeah, I just, I do feel so sorry for him. Um, I feel, yeah, he just, he just deserves better. Like I say, as the fans do, and that's why Spurs have just got to sort it out because. You've got the Nagelsmann decision. You've got the Pochettino decision. Um, and every single defeat that's coming this season increases the pressure on Daniel Levy to get this managerial appointment right. And I know we've said this before. And this is the thing. I know people get frustrated when we say this. But but he still does get it. have to get it right. It, it doesn't matter whether the previous ones have been wrong. This one still has to be right. Um, it's not even just the manager, is it? It's the director of football as well. He has to get that right. We still don't entirely know which way round that's going to come. It's still unclear as to whether who's going to arrive first uh, because both searches are taking place simultaneously. I think I said in the last video that the candidates for both will be chosen on how well they will mesh or, or certainly how well um, you know Levy, in, in essence, is going to have to pick a pair that he believes will gel, rather than there being two very random candidates. Um, that's the that's the plan. Uh, but as we always say, a director of football does need to choose his head coach. That's the ideal way of that system working. Um, but I think there's probably is this fear of resetting the whole process again if you were to bring in a director of football and then say, OK, you go and get your own person um, because you know it happened in 2021 when Pratchett she came in and just went oh that's your shortlist oh that's lovely <laughs> let's start again um, and he picked Nuno <sighs> <sighs> and this is the thing it's like I saw a couple of people on Twitter clinging to the hope after the Nagelsmann stuff that they, they dug up an old tweet of mine that said and it was the case at the time that Nuno was not a candidate he was absolutely not on Spurs shortlist was not a candidate then Paratici I think a month later came in like I say ripped up that shortlist and suddenly Nuno became a candidate and I just said to them anyone that was like 
I'm clinging to this. I said, don't cling to this. That's what happens when a director of football comes in and changes it. And as some people rightly said, you know, what if a director of football came in and said, I want Julian Nagelsmann? I don't think that can happen now, personally. Um, it would be an incredible U-turn. It would be a very different U-turn to the Nuno Espirito Santo one, probably one that fans would want a lot more. Um, but yeah, I would be stunned. You can never rule anything out in the world of Tottenham Hotspur but it would seem very odd uh, for the club to be so insistent on someone not being in consideration and then saying to a new director of football, oh, you want him? Oh, OK, then. It just, yeah. Who knows? They're more than capable of doing that. Um, you know, there's so many candidates out there that fulfil this criteria of being a project manager for the long term, rebuilding a club, bringing in ta attacking football to the club. Um you know, we know, I don't feel that he suits this, that scenario at all, but we know Luis Enrique has been considered, which is one of the oddest ones for me, uh, because for me, if we think of it as a, a trilogy, he would be the final part of a trilogy um, of glamour appointments of Mourinho, Conte, and then Luis Enrique, big names who fit wonderfully elsewhere, but fit Tottenham, like a glove that's kind of like missing fingers and everything. Uh, looked like I was about to do something rude there. Um, yeah, it's... Look, certainly Spurs would have a lot more of the ball. Um, they would uh, maybe have too much of the ball. It would be like going from one extreme to the other. Um, look, you know my views. I, I would, If Spurs went for him, I would get behind it and I would... Uh, Obviously, try to look for the um, all the, all the benefit, uh, the positives, and, and see how it would work, and speak to those who worked with him before, and and obviously just you kind of wipe and try and have a fresh slate, which is what I did with the past with with Jose Mourinho as well. I had various journalists when he joined telling me, oh, you know, won't, you won't like this about, him, you won't like that. He'll do this, he'll do that. But I just went, you know what? I'm just going to absolutely have a clean slate. Go in, let's see what he does. Um, and I would be the same with Enrique, but it does not fit that criteria for me. It absolutely does not. For me, it's a it's a job for someone like a Ruben Amarin. It's a job for someone like an Arna Slot. It's a job for well, a Roberto De Zerbi. Um A you'd be mad to leave Brighton right now, especially a team of the up. We saw what they did today against Arsenal as well. Uh, looks likely that they'll take that sixth spot, if if not challenge higher. Um, I also think, from Spurs' point of view, it would be another Italian with a very strong point of view. Um, would they dare do that again? Um, and also very expensive as well to get him out of his contract. Although, as I said before, why should you be worried about spending, um, you know, an amount of money on a a manager that is nowhere near what you'd spend on a player that you'd really want. Although some people pointed out about players being assets and things like this, which obviously financially I, I understand that. Um, yeah, I mean, even Javi Alonso. I would still maintain hugely that if you appoint Javi Alonso, you might as well pick Ryan Mason because they're almost as experienced as each other. I think Alonso's had 30 games as a manager... Mason's had 12, you know, we're not talking about many more games. Um, and obviously Mason has the advantage of knowing the club and, and the, the things that need to be fixed and the messes that lie and the, the skeletons in the closet as well. So, yeah, yeah, but they do. They all, all of those I've just said kind of fit that project manager thing so much better. Um, Spurs need to recreate what they, they had under Poch right at the start it's a very similar feeling scenario maybe with a slightly better base ever so slightly I know some would argue about that um although I suppose position wise they're not going to finish too differently to how they did under Tim Sherwood that season um but yeah and even that when Potts was appointed let's be honest it was a bit of a fluke uh in terms of Levy wanted Louis van Gaal didn't get him he turned to his second choice, which was uh, uh, Mauricio Pochettino, and we know what happened next. So, 
this is the issue, isn't it? It's it's Tottenham need to reset, they need to rebuild, they need to reconnect with a fan base that is so tired. The amount of people I was speaking to today that some of them had given up their tickets in recent games. There were some of them really questioning whether they would renew their season tickets for next season. And it's I was talking to them, it's such a difficult scenario that because let's be honest, we're all suckers, aren't we? We are as, as fans and journalists as well. And I will no doubt be the same come the summer whoever comes in I will have hope I will believe again next season and that's you know as Morgan Freeman's character was it red I'm trying to remember and Shawshank said you know about hope it's a dangerous thing there's someone screaming outside I don't know whether they've uh, done like the Shawshank Redemption sounds like some kids running around there. um yeah but it is the hope and, and this is the thing I was talking to about the season tickets and all that it's like I get it, and I will at this moment feel like, oh, where are Spurs going? But I know me as a journalist, when it comes around to next season, I'll be believing again, or hoping again, more than believing, maybe. Um, and I'm sure fans are very similar. There's this feeling of wanting to give up the season ticket, but there's another feeling of, yeah, but what if it is good? It's like, even if there's like half a percent chance you don't want to have given up your ticket. And the problem is, I guess, is... I don't know how many there are, but I imagine there's a lot of people on waiting lists waiting for them as well. I, I don't know that, that. I don't don't know any of the figures. I'm absolutely guessing. Um, but yeah, it's. I did feel for them because it, it's a tough choice and it's a lot of money. People pay a lot of money, and to have been served up what they have this season was not value for money. I understand, especially in right now with the the cost of living just shooting up, and and it's a difficult choice to continue with a season ticket. So. Yeah, there's a few hard choices there to be made for people, I understand it. And uh, like I said earlier, it's the apathy that's the most worrying thing for me, is that people, a lot of people aren't even angry anymore. There was one guy who was telling me today, he was chatting away, and he said, I just went out, I just went out to shops, I looked at my phone occasionally, to see, oh, okay, they're losing at half time, oh, right, they've lost. And that, for me, is the saddest thing. It's like actually not caring about a club as much as you always have, a club you've loved from, you know, probably when you were born, but actually, the decisions at the club have actually put you in this frame of mind where, uh, whatever. And that's really, really sad. Um, you know, there's been so many mistakes made. There's been so many disappointments made. Um, not disappointments made. Disappointments to be had. There's been some good times. But obviously, you know, when you're... When you're looking at the last four years and a lot of decisions made by Daniel Levy have been, you know, have ended up being mistakes. Um, obviously, you can't control everything. You can't control whether someone missing it. This is the arg argument that some people, again, were making to me today. He, he can't control what happens in a, a cup final or a semi-final and stuff. Obviously, he can have a say on the, on the strength of the squad that plays in that. But, you know, I guess he can't control the Champions League final, I guess, is a good example of a really flat game. It was like, what, I guess the penalty decision kind of killed it a bit, but it was a, a lot of time. But ultimately, you know, he has made a, a fair few mistakes with these decisions over a lack of um, plan, a lot of, a lack of direction. And, and this is why people are, are, are so upset and angry. And, and I'm really worried about the atmosphere on um, Saturday because we've got the double header. It's Brentford, obviously the Tottenham Hotspur women play as well. And my fear is that the women, like the, the people might not stay for that because they might be so fed up with what happened in the previous game. and, and Or if they take um, their understandable frustration, but they take that into the women's game. It just uh, And obviously the women are in a precarious position as well themselves and yeah, you know, it's like I say, it's four years of bad decisions, but decades worth of, I guess, failure in terms of getting silverware. Maybe not failure in terms of the progress that have been made in certain aspects, um, but certainly failure in terms of landing those pieces of silverware that just still haven't come. Um, and yeah, like I say, that Poch announcement is going to be horrible. And people are not going to like it. It's going to make people very, very angry. Um, seeing one of the most popular alternatives in Nagelsmann not being anywhere near now the managerial search is not going to make people happy. Um, look, 
Spurs all say that they're being patient, they're doing all their due diligence, that they're trying to get the right man for the managerial role and the director of football. But the problem is, we heard a lot of this in 2021, and it was 72, 76 days, I can't remember the exact number, um, lurching from one kind of manager to the next. They ended up with Nuno. So there isn't a trust there. This is the problem. You can't say the same things you said when you completely messed up before because no one trusts what you say. Um, and it's, like I said in, in a piece I wrote earlier, it, trust is not a currency Daniel Levy has to work with right now. He's lost a lot of trust with a big old section of the fan base. Um, and these chants, you know, they're continuing in every single game and they're, they're getting louder and more frequent. Um and the only way that he can dampen them down, if not stop them, is just to, is to show some strong leadership, I guess, and, and and show that there's a direction for the club. And, and like I said, using the whole ocean analogy, it just feels cast adrift. Um, and there's nothing stopping um, Daniel Levy from coming out with a very clear message and just saying, look, we're going to appoint someone in the summer. Uh, it's not going to happen before the end of the season. You need to be patient. We'll, we will do our best to get the right person for this role. And it's just, oh, you know, I moan about it all the time. The lack of clarity and communication. And yes, I know I moaned about the fact that on Friday night, there was not the communication that anyone needed. But just in terms, I think, of the overarching thing, the grand plan, nobody knows what Tottenham's grand plan is. And that gives the sense of, do they really know what their grand plan is? That's the most worrying thing about it all. Um and again, when you've got so many changes coming, when you've got a going to have a new director of football, when you've got a new head coach, when you've got a new chief football officer in Scott Munn coming in as well, there's so many unknown variables now. What happens with Harry Kane? Uh, what happens if Hugo Lloris is captain? What happens with a lot of these players that have been around the club? And I was talking to, I can't remember who was, another journo uh, yesterday, and I was saying, I think there's a lot of players now, or a group of players who... Whether you like them or not, whether you think they're good or not, whether they desperately want to stay at the club or not, I think we've got to a point where they almost have to leave for their own good because I don't think they're actually doing their careers any good by staying at the club because of the, the hammering they get from the, uh, the fans. It's like this vicious circle. They play badly. The fans lose faith in them. The fans will obviously get on their back when they're frustrated and those players will continue to get worse. Um... I just think there's a few players within the club now that just need to... I'm talking about a reset. They need to reset their careers elsewhere. And that's not saying I want them out of the club or anything like that, but I just feel for their own good, they need to play football elsewhere. Um, and look, I'm going to leave that open. I'm not going to name names. I'm going to say that, that you guys can guess who I'm thinking of. Um, but there are players, I think, that... Yeah, I just I just feel like they're associated with the club's inability to reach another level. And I don't think that will ever change. There's the odd player that a manager can give a new lease of life to. Um, but yeah, sometimes maybe you just need to start afresh um, with a clean slate for for the squad. Um, and in terms of actually having a clean slate of players, uh, more so than they all get a clean slate. But um, we'll see. We'll see. This has been Spurs on their biggest issues has also been getting players out the door. Um, and this is why when you look at someone like Ruben Amarim, it's quite interesting because he plays with a back three. He could get the best out of Pedro Porro. If I'm Tottenham, I'm seeing him as an attractive option. I think he has... I don't think he'll be cheap. I think he comes with a bit of a release clause. But you look at him and you think, OK, well, maybe the squad that is there is set up for a, you know, a back three kind of manager. Does that mean there's less changes made instead you just tailor tailor the squad a bit better to what he wants and bring in improvements in certain situation um, positions in the squad um yeah he's an interesting one Amarin. he is um obviously I've, I've sat in his press conferences before in the champions league and he's a very clever guy knows knows his mind knows what he wants knows what kind of football he wants like i said there's so many of them i'd be quite happy with and i think a lot of these young managers, you know, I think Amarin Slot to Zerbi, certainly those three, and no to Zerbi, I think, is, is 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 the toughest of the lot to try and get. And I think uh, Slot won the, the Eredivisie today, didn't they? I think Feyenoord were 
um, won their title. I'm pretty sure I saw that as I was leaving the game. Um, those three, I think all three are managers that I think a lot of the fan base would go, right, we'll give them a chance. I think they're that kind of managers. I don't think they're quite at the level of a Nagelsmann where everyone would be really excited and get behind them. <coughs> but I definitely think they'd have a chance. I think a lot of people would get behind them in terms of, well, let's see what you can do. Um, and they wouldn't be on their backs instantly and they would know, yeah, these guys are guys that kind of have to rebuild a squad and we understand that's going to have to take a little bit of patience. I hope there's patience. It's difficult because patience has been worn thin for everyone. Um, I understand that 100%. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. So it did end up being a little bit of a rant after the nice stuff about watching former players and being able to interview some of my players that I saw as a bit of heroes um, back in the day. Um, but there you go. So, like I say, a double header on Saturday. I'll be there. Um, again, thank you so much to the very, very nice people that I saw today. Um, it made it all the more enjoyable in the sunshine, having lots of nice chats with people. Um, and yeah, yeah, we'll see what Saturday brings. We'll see what the uh, how this season finishes. <coughs> I want European football. I absolutely do. Even if it's a Conference League, I do. I, I want it for the the trips that I can go on because I love following Spurs abroad. It, it's, it's a fascinating kind of process and, and I know the fans that go out on them enjoy themselves as well but I also think for a squad you need a deep squad for the Premier League which means you need games to play them in um, and especially the Conference League you know that there's especially in the earlier stages there is an ability to to use more players I know people don't like hearing that but you kind of have to rotate your squad in it um, so yeah let's see I was saying this to um to one of the um, Spurs fans today um, at the stadium um, at the Bishop Silverstone sort of watching the uh, the charity game that I don't know whether I'm just a crazy fool I probably am a crazy fool but the thing I am clinging on to and I know people will argue yeah but the man at the top isn't changing but with so many fresh aspects to it, with a new director of football, with a new manager, with this chief financial officer, uh, football officer, sorry, and Scott Munn coming in, with a potential new captain, with new players coming in the summer, there is a chance for it to be different. There is a, a, an opportunity to create something better. There is something that we can, new faces to talk about, new faces to write about, new faces to hopefully give us uh, new beginnings and new endings. Um, and maybe I am. Maybe I'm just a romantic fool. But I'm going to cling to that as something that I can look forward to this summer and, and hope. We've got to get there first. Don't get it wrong. There could be more twists and turns and the madness of 2021 again. But at the end of it, we'll have new things to focus on. And right now, I'm desperate for new things to focus on. Because what's happening right now is a mess um and from top to bottom you know i think uh we need to see more unity between the the academy and the, and the first team you know i'm someone that really looks to the academy and how they're getting on and, and the pathway to the first team i want to see much more of that um and yeah and and maybe with the timing of everything and where spurs are and, and the rebuild maybe if the new manager comes in there's a bit of pochettino feel that they can use younger players then great I'd be absolutely on board with that as well. So, yeah, something to cling on to, something exciting to enjoy. I kind of almost just want to get this season over and done with, try and get top seven um, and then look to what the future holds. And, yeah, I know people will say, well, Daniel Levy at the top, it may never change. Look, I don't think Daniel Levy wants the club to fail. I would, I pretty much would be certain that he doesn't because even if you're going to look at it from a financial point of view, that's no business sense. Um I just hope that after many, many, you know, decisions that have not worked out, he will now concentrate on off the field matters and allow Scott Munn to come in and be his decision maker when it comes to the football stuff. Obviously, with this structure underneath it, with the director of football and the head coach and everything. We'll see. We'll see. Um, I can't promise it's going to happen, but I just kind of hope it does at this stage just to... Uh, too many gaffes, too many communication is just. Ugh. Yeah, 
Right. As a man who deals with communication, who deals with kind of writing in the media and do, talking and all this sort of stuff, you know how communication sits with me and how much it annoys me when things that seem so simple in a way to deal with the fans and, and the public and the media, Tottenham seem to make so difficult. And they just, the decisions made when it comes to communicating with all such parties is so bad. Um, I think I think mistakes would be better... Um, not accepted, but understood if they were able to be explained, and they just never are. But there you go. I'm going to head off and enjoy the rest of my Sunday. Uh, I've got a lot of transcribing to do, a lot of interviews uh, with all those excellent, uh, fantastic players earlier, um, harking to uh, enjoyable times at Tottenham. Um, although, I guess, trophyless times, but still... There was a lot of players out there, even like Wilson Palacio. I know he only came on for like a minute, but just even players like that. I'd, I'd forgotten about how good he was when he first came with Sandro. Sandro was an incredible player before he had knee problems. Um, and even just seeing Harry Redknapp back in the dugout was quite good fun as well. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, th I think of nicer times um, and hopefully nicer times are to come. I shall leave, I'll leave you with that hopefully positive note um yeah time to head off i shall do a probably next video will be sunday unless something big breaks in the week that we can talk about but uh yeah i think we covered plenty today hopefully and apologies if it got a little bit downbeat and depressing towards the end but maybe maybe they say it's always darkest before the dawn maybe the dawn will be uh something exciting for us so gonna head off now as always, stay safe, stay healthy, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Goodbye.